we interrupt this program to bring you Courage the Cowardly Dog Show, starring Courage the Cowardly Dog! You're listening to That's Pretty Dark. The podcast where we talk about all of the entertainment that scared us as children and still haunts us as adults. So grab your flashlight and join us as we take a frightfully nostalgic look over our shoulders and under our beds and in our closets. And together we'll realize, well, that's pretty that's dark. Pretty dark. <laughs> uh, yep. Yep. Here we are. Just going to shotgun this beer real quick. <laughs> Just kidding. I've never shotgun a beer and I hope I never do. No, it sounds disgusting, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I almost spat that out. <laughs> I don't know why. We weren't, we weren't big partiers in college. If you hadn't no. picked that up by um, everything you've ever heard about us. By literally everything. Our nerdiness. I don't know what would give them that idea that we don't love being around crowds of other people who do stupid things. Yeah, it sounds Isn't that weird? like just the best place on earth <laughs> to be. You know what the best place to be on, on earth is? Where? <laughs> here, right now, recording this freaking <laughs> podcast. I really like your sentence structure. My name's Christian, sentence structure, my. <laughs> and my name's Kaylin Critical Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> my name is also Christian Money Pants, because <laughs> I just... I just wrapped a movie. Oh, yeah. And now I'm home again and I feel great. He texted home. me when he wrapped his movie and he said he was a tired boy, but also a money boy. And also I said, a money boy. I said, congratulations or something to the effect of something like that. I don't even remember what I you, said, except said for the fact that I called money you pants. money pants. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, it's good. While you were on your movie, guess what I was doing? Judging by the appearance of your office. Yeah. I would say. You were updating your office. Yeah, I was uh, <laughs> dealing with all of this. It's been kind of the catch-all room. It's the only room that my cats don't have access to in my house. Hey, mine too. So whenever I have something that I don't really want to worry about them, like getting into eating, etc. Cat-free I just space. Toss it in here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not a big room. There's not enough space for that. But your office looks great. Thank it's, you. It's green. It's so green. It's, right now it's green. Yeah, I got one of those fancy like, you know, streamer lamps that mm -hmm. you can change the color of. And before we were recording, I was showing Christian all of the functions. I went through like 20 different functions and we mm -hmm. were just like mesmerized by the lamp, you know, like, like we didn't whom, have any work to do whom, or anything. Whom, it was, whom, whom, yeah, whom, there's a ver whom. there's a, a mode that goes with sound, like by your voice or by the music or whatever. And cool. I had that on briefly and we were both like, this is far too distracting. It's like the ghosts were talking to us. It was weird. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're being communicated with. From the other side. That'd be dope. But yeah, now I have an office. It's not complete, but it's in progress. Let's sit perfectly silent in your office now. Lights out with a Ouija board between us. A Ouija, excuse me. And just wait for the lights to flicker. That sounds completely terrifying. What are you doing on Halloween? I'm down. All right. That's terrifying. Speaking of terrifying things, though, you want to get into this episode <laughs> now and do we'll it? Now we'll segue. Yes. Let's do it to them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. And speaking of just a disclaimer up top. Yeah. My new office also involves some new tech, a new oh, microphone. Yeah. New tech alert. So if you notice any tech issues, it's the ghost, it's not me. Or it's the microphone. Or it's the microphone. All right, so we are doing our first Courage episode. This is season one, episode one. Long awaited. 1A and 1B. It's two segments. Yes. We're covering both segments here tonight, folks. Mm -hmm. And that at the Cats Motel and... Cajun Granny Stew. If these titles are surprising to you, they were surprising to us too. We're doing mm -hmm. our best at going in the correct order. Yeah. This is our guess at the correct order. We might be wrong. So according to uh, IMDB and the wiki, the Courage Wiki, mm -hmm. A Night at the Cat's Motel released on November 12th, 1999. But according to the wiki, Cajun Granny Stew released on December 17th. So that's like a whole different month entirely. Yeah. So we have no real idea. No real clue how this worked. We'll have to just ask the guys who made it. <laughs> yeah. Which, And see you know, what they say. We might get a chance to do. So the IMDB summary for Cat's Motel. I'm going to go and kind of like talk a little bit about both. Perfect. Muriel, Eustace, and Courage check into a motel run by a sinister cat named Cats. It turns out to be a very long night when Cats turns his spiders loose on them. Mm. In the wiki summary for Cajun Granny Stew, Courage must defend Muriel from a fox who is trying to steal her for use as a main ingredient in his Cajun Granny Stew. 
which he hopes will win first prize. Yeah, that was succinct. Both of these episodes were written by John R. Dilworth. Yeah, Dilly. And Irvin S. Bauer, with David Cohen as the head writer. Yes. Did you talk about Irvin Bauer? I did not, okay. that I recall. We will hear Irvin Bauer's name a lot. He passed away in 2015, but he was the senior story consultant for the entire run of Courage. Wow. Uh, and he did a lot of the writing and coming up with episode stories and concepts throughout the whole thing. I really love the title, Story Consultant. Yeah? That's just dope to me. I just like the it's idea It's a pretty of that. cool title. I want to be a story consultant, you know? I've consulted you on plenty of stories. <gasps> You're my senior story consultant. I'm a story consultant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. I, I mean, invite I, you over all the time. You're not wrong. That's Come, very true. Listen to my ideas and tell me how good they are. Wow. And not how bad they are. Yeah. Mostly you just pay me to tell you how good they are. I don't pay you shit. All right. You pay me in Oreos. <laughs> I was gonna, <laughs> we have we have done that. Oh, remember that Oreo cake we used to get <gasps> oh, from uh I think Rouse's? about it. I think about it all the time. Oh, they don't have it anymore. I know. You've told me that, which is just depressing. I'm sad. Mm. I'm depressed. I can't eat it anyway. Lactose intolerance. I'm real hangdog about it. Because we're here to talk about how growing up kind of sucks. Growing up sucks. And this stuff makes it better. Mm-hmm. And both these episodes were directed by John R. Dilworth. Dilly. Let's do a little bit of dallying. Let's dally, shall we? Ready for my summary of the Cats Motel episode? <gasps> oh, yeah. Yeah, this will be better. Returning home from vacation, Muriel, Eustace, and Courage check into a motel run by a murderous, voyeuristic cat mm -hmm. named Cats. Cats. In his sadistic attempts to catch Muriel and Eustace unawares, Cats keeps a close eye on them as they settle into their evening, waiting patiently for the right moment to release his starved, large, and seemingly radioactive pet spiders. Mm. Poor Courage, who has been tied up outside because there are no dogs allowed. Mm-hmm has to find a way back into the motel so he can thwart Katz's evil plans and save both Eustace and Muriel from being bound up in the spider's webbing and eaten alive. Wow. 10 out of 10. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take my I'm clapping, but I don't think you can hear it on my new fancy microphone. Oh, no. It's so it's so good at the the condensing. <laughs> the What's the word? I don't know the right word. I'm not. <laughs> Actually, I do think you're right. Condensing. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this episode really struck a chord with me and my inner child yeah. who watched this. <laughs> oh yeah. I remember this one very well. And I'm sure they will continue to. I mean, but yeah, like this, maybe even more than the Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes that we've covered in our previous season binge. Yeah. I think this episode was in there real deep. <laughs> Those spiders, man. So cats. There's something about it. Yeah. The dark hallways and the mm -hmm. spiders. I remember all those visuals very well. Same. The hallways. You're Wow. I like that you said the hallways because me too, for some reason, mm -hmm. the liminal spaces. All right. So we're going to get into Katz's motivation here in a bit, but I want to begin this segment by delving a little into what I think was John Dilworth's motivation. So let's start with the name. Does Katz Motel remind you of anything from horror pop culture? It does, Christian. In fact, it does. You want to hit me with that one particular well, other name? What it reminds me of is the Bates Motel. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> you got that right. We didn't prep and plan this, by the no, way. We, we, we prepped didn't. separately. <laughs> I just knew the whole time that you were thinking this too. Oh, yeah. And I knew that you were smiling with glee because I was. you showed me Psycho I did. in just the last couple of years. So I knew yeah, you were going to probably I brag even have that. Yeah. about how you introduced it. Yeah, that's it in go your notes. Right, go right ahead. You're reading my notes for me, practically. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I had in my notes because... I forced Christian to watch Psycho in the last year. I, I mean, I was, recently, I right? was excited to. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I didn't force him. You just gave me the reason to finally watch it. Which was really great. It was. And so that's what I was thinking of the entire time. We're going to talk so much about Psycho. I'm excited. Specifically, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Yes. Adapted from the novel of the same name by Robert Block. So the name Cat's Motel wasn't immediately apparent to me as a reference. But the first couple visuals were. First, we see the glowing electric sign yes. that says Cat's Motel with no yes. vacancy beneath it. No vacancy. Except the no is blinking in and out ominously. Which honestly has become such like an icon in pop culture. Because of Psycho. It's a um, cliche almost, yeah. Yeah, this is a direct reference to the Bates Motel no vacancy sign, which we see multiple times throughout the film, and Norman Bates himself regularly makes a point of talking about. I just didn't see a point in turning the light on. Mm -hmm. I really ought to turn the light on. Yeah. We don't get many travelers around this way. Man, that no vacancy sign. The no vacancy sign. It lives sign. in my head. And so when I see it, 
in life. I always get the heebie-jeebies. The second visual, the bag family pulling up in their truck to this dark mm-hmm. motel in the middle of nowhere. The cabin's off to the side with the main office nearby, big flashes of lightning, crashes of thunder, and this mimics Mary and Crane stopping at the Bates Motel mm-hmm. because due to the big storm, it's no longer safe to keep driving on the highway. There's always a big storm. Always a big storm that leads the traveler off the road. They always. can't see where they're going, but they see the light in the distance, the beacon, mm-hmm. the no vacancy sign or the vacancy Safety. sign. Safety. You'll be safe here. Mm-hmm. I've told you before, like I think of this in a, when I used to play house when I was a kid, it was always, there's a big storm outside. You need to come inside and be safe. Oh, me too. Us too. I don't know why, but that was For always sure. the narrative. So it's not just Cat's Motel, but this episode is A Night at the Cat's Motel. Mm -hmm. This gives the whole thing a rather ritzy sort of flair, Mm -hmm. uh, which suits the smooth, jazzy beatbox Mm -hmm. theme that seems to follow cats around like an aura. The theme music with the character is something that I remember being distinct to Courage compared to other things I was watching at the time. Yeah. I feel like that was something that they really did intentionally. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I heard the music for Cats, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this. This sort of character theme is known as a, a light motif which was famously used and perfected by German composer Richard Wagner. Hey, we talked about him just recently. Yeah. Ghost Bride episode. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Nazi. Nazi? Yeah. <laughs> Freaking Nazi, writing about weddings and stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, just as Mary and Crane inquired about a room from Norman Bates, Eustace and Muriel inquire the same from a sly red cat named Katz. Katz is voiced by Paul Schofler, whose name we're going to hear a lot during the season bench Mm -hmm. because he's voiced at least one character in nearly every episode of Courage. That's amazing. In the first season alone, he's the voice of Cats, Cajun Fox, Mm -hmm. LeQuack, Freaky Fred, Dr. Vindaloo, Big Toe, Goose God, Errol Von Volkheim, The Snowman, Bobby Ganoush, and The Nowhere Newsman. Wow. I had a vague knowledge that a lot of the villains were voiced by the same guy, mm-hmm. especially when I heard his voice again. I was like, I know him. I'm excited to watch all this and see how, like, see the range or hear the range of his voice. Oh, because, yeah, it, it is definitely impressive. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the Cats Motel. I'm Cats. Will you please sign in? One of the first things we see in the office of the Cats Motel is the guest book, Mm -hmm. which has been filled out with the names of a few of the people working on Courage. Yeah. This is the third reference to Psycho. In Psycho, there's a running thread of importance throughout the film regarding the guest book, Mm -hmm. because Marion Crane puts down a false name, and within moments, she tells Norman her real name. This goes on as a point of both confusion and significance when the private investigator is hired to find her, and he's able to match her handwriting to the false name given. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. They built their names into a lot of the backgrounds and things like that Mm -hmm. throughout. The chainsaw we see Courage using is a Dill brand chainsaw. It is, yes. Keep a lookout with us, listener. Write in if we miss one. Yeah, let us know. Especially John Dilworth. He liked to put his name into the shows that he created. So Katz now points out that there are no dogs allowed. No dogs. So Eustace ties Courage's leash to a pole outside. Break my heart. And of course, adding insult to injury and scaring Courage to death by yelling at him, this big kaboom. Yeah. Not not quite his booga 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 yet. That's really Eustace's first jump scare, though, like of Courage. Mm -hmm. And this is a running gag that they do. So I have a quick rant. Please. Yes, Courage is a dog. And many people think it's okay to tie animals up outside, exposed to the elements. Um, mm. This is not true. Nope. It's not okay to do this to animals. Nope. Because even if they were wild and not domesticated, aka 100% totally relying on you to take care of them, they would still be able to seek their own shelter in a way that makes them feel safe Mm -hmm. and secure and protected. Mm -hmm. Tied up to a post and left out in the rain or the heat or the cold is never okay under any circumstances whatsoever. Never, ever. It's neglect. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it hurt my heart just to see with Courage. (laughs) And yet, as we yelled about during our Intro to Courage episodes, Courage doesn't just represent a house pet. No. He's the every child. Yes. So in this case, and many others that we will encounter during our season binges of Courage, the sheer neglect of putting Courage outside represents adults making decisions that benefit themselves, even though it hurts their own children. 
or those who are dependent on them. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful moral here, if there is one to be found, is that by putting courage outside, they're actively putting themselves into danger. Yeah. I wonder if that was subconsciously intentional. Maybe. I don't know. I would sleep in my car with my animal before I would get a room that they weren't welcome in. Yeah, you can just pull over at a rest stop or something. It's not especially safe to do that either, but still. I've done it. You're a man. Oh, man. (laughs) See, Norman Bates isn't the only motel owner keeping a secret in the room behind the office. No, he is not. In his own version of this room, Katz houses a giant nest of large neon-colored spiders. My loves, dinner has arrived. Oh, and by the way, your web is such a mess. Clean it up. What he's referring to is the scattered human skulls and other bone fragments Mm -hmm. littering the floor of the dark room. They'll eat you. They'll eat you. Chomp. Now, I know there was the occasional animated bovine cranium out in the deserts of other cartoons, Mm -hmm. which TV Tropes calls the desert skull. (laughs) Yeah, that's so common. So common. I think of the elephant graveyard in uh, Lion King as well. Ooh, yeah, the big uh, rib cage is also a a different trope. Mm -hmm. But these are from animals. The desert skull is from a bull or a buffalo Mm -hmm. or something, not a human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think even Scooby-Doo or Are You showed real human bones, quote unquote real. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. That's a good point, though. And yes, Disney's The Skeleton Dance, Silly Symphony, Mm -hmm. were dancing human skeletons in a graveyard. And I've always loved that shit. But even those had an air of whimsy and magic to them. Yes. Like they were supernatural. Obviously, they came back to life, right? Yeah. You should tell the people what I what I got you last time I was in uh, Disney World. Oh, the uh, yeah, the um, bottle opener. Yeah, it's like a corkscrew, but it's silly symphonies. Yeah, and corkscrew. It's the skeleton. It's yeah, pretty cool. it is super cool. I've used it. We like that stuff. We do like that stuff. We spooky. And I'm not saying Courage is the only children's program that ever showed human bones, but the human bones in the Cats Motel weren't symbols of something natural like death. Mm. They were symbols of something unnatural, like murder. Dun dun dun. And speaking of murder. Let's take a quick look at one of America's most famous horror hotels. Oh my gosh, I was not expecting this. Infamously known as the Murder Castle, due to the sheer amount of murders committed inside said hotel, which was named the Castle. Murders committed by the same man who designed and built the place, the owner-operator, Henry Howard Holmes, Mm. born Herman Webster Mudgett, Mm -hmm. but known worldwide to this day as H.H. Holmes. The insurance scamming medical doctor, pharmacist, architect, flim flam man, serial killer (laughs) who capitalized on the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, also known as the World's Columbian Exposition, in his attempts to make as much money as he could and satisfy his own particular thirst for murder. I just didn't, I should have seen this coming and I did not. You and I both know the story very, very well. We do. And probably a lot of you do too. But if you don't, Holmes did this by building a massive hotel the size of a city block. Three stories high, over a hundred rooms, and with a basement specifically designed for torture, death, and horror. Terrifying. It is. Truly terrifying. Holmes had nine confirmed murders, 27 confessed murders, and because we have no way of knowing for sure, experts estimate that his body count could have been as high as 200. Sickening. Without going into too much detail, I think it's of particular interest to mention one of the many things that were later discovered by police in the basement of the murder castle. Countless pieces of human bone fragments. Mm. There were human skulls, human ribs, a human shoulder blade, a human hip socket, Mm. and not to mention multiple whole female skeletons. Mm -hmm. Some of these bones were found in the crematorium, in pits dug into the floor, in the wooden boxes next to his operating table, or simply cast aside littering the floor, making a mess of his own nest. Oh, his nest. Gross. (laughs) For me, this darkens the spider room of the cat's motel. Yeah. If we think it's just some routine cartoon violence to show us the bones of human beings who'd been murdered at this motel, I suggest we think again. And look at us going into true crime two episodes in a row. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't really think of it that way, but you're making good points. This one calls for it. Here, here. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. It just, it implies murder, not just, oh, this is a desolate place. Here are some human bones. It wasn't, yeah, death by natural causes. Like you said, it's death by very unnatural causes. Causes. It's not like finding a skeleton in like a cave or a cavern or something, mm-hmm. an abandoned ship. Oh yeah, like Goonies. Like Goonies or something. This is outright murder. Secret mm-hmm. murder. So now that we know that the spiders exist, with Courage tied up outside and Eustace and Muriel in their room, 
uh, which is room 666 and a half, by the way. I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, I wrote that down too. <laughs> we are forced to acknowledge what is arguably the creepiest aspect of this episode, the voyeurism, which is really kind of the only thing that you and I talked about mm -hmm. before doing this episode. Yeah. Which is how, how that stuck out as like yes. the main thing. Whenever we see the portrait right and there. the eyes slide away and Kat's eyes replace them. Mm-hmm. And it's like right above the bed yeah. in this room. Right over the bed. And then we see it in the shower head. <laughs> yes, we do. Which, I mean, arguably, that's that's pretty rough for kids' fiction. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it would have bumped me like that when I was a kid, necessarily, immediately. Well, you, don't, you don't think about it like that. No, I kids. didn't think about it like that as a kid at all. But now looking at it, I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. That's not, that's not okay. Yeah. So it, as a kid, I think it was creepy just with that idea of like somebody's watching you. And then as an adult, it takes on a whole new level of creepy. Yeah. There's something in the dark watching you. You feel like you're being watched. Mm -hmm. Or like we talked about in the skeleton man, she discovers that the creepy man set up the security camera. Yes. To watch her room. The Captured Souls episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark? Oh my God. Absolutely. Captured it's Souls. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Voyeuristic kind of motel bed and breakfast. Yeah. Cameras and mirrors and all that kind of I shit. I mean, I think it lends itself to the hotel or the motel idea because you have complete control in this place where people are coming to be very vulnerable. They're sleeping. They're, you know, like their, their guard is down. Mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to the bags, Katz is watching them from inside the walls. Like you said, First, we have the classic haunted house trope of the eyes and the painting on the wall, looking down on Eustace asleep in the bed. And second, we have the slightly more humorous yet ten times more creepy eye of cats inside the shower head mm -hmm. in the bathroom, where Muriel is undressing to try and enjoy a relaxing bath. And I will also mention here the rubber ducky. <laughs> yeah, instead of a rubber ducky, it's a rubber chicken, chicken from, from outer space. space. <laughs> I love it. I like anything that's self-referential. Me too. Something else that I noticed is that uh, Eustace sleeps in his hat. Oh, <laughs> I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah. Does he ever take it off? Do I, you we know, ever see it off? I do feel like we see him with it off, but we'll have to get there because I think yeah, it does I take remember. some time. But he sleeps with it on. Interesting. You know, if you're that dedicated to the cause, I guess. <laughs> so a few things about this voyeurism. Feeding your guests to your pet spiders is obviously horrifying. Mm -hmm. But in a real world sense, all things considered... It's pretty unrealistic. Sure. You might even say it's unlikely. Yeah, I would oh, I would say unlikely, yes. <laughs> I would give you that. <laughs> What's much more realistic and much more likely is that if you rent a room in a cheap motel. Vomit. Or a cheap room in someone's house. Or you rent a cheap apartment or condo for the mm -hmm. weekend through a vacation rental app. Yeah. It's much more likely that you will be watched. I can't, I cannot even think about it. Or photographed. Oh. Or filmed without your knowledge or consent. or consent. These voyeuristic accessories, the painting and the shower head, are yet again both references to Psycho. The first indicator that Norman Bates is anything but what he seems is when Marion goes to her room and Norman goes into the parlor room behind the main office where he removes a painting from the wall, mm -hmm. behind which is revealed a peephole, through which he watches Marion undress, yep. preparing herself for a shower. And the shower scene is, of course, very famous. Very. In fact, it's considered the most famous scene in cinematic history. Like all cinema? Like not just horror, huh? Probably the most recognizable moment. Wow. While taking a shower, Norman Bates' mother comes into the bathroom with a large knife and stabs Marion to death. Quote unquote, Norman Bates' mother. Right. As dark as it is, this is why Muriel is watched while undressing for her bath and why she's attacked once she's relaxing in the warm water. Mm -hmm. Not a shower but a bath, not a psycho, but a spider. <laughs> when the spider comes out of the faucet. Plops into the bath water. I have thought about that for so many years. Every, Pretty much every time I got mm -hmm. in a bath or shower for mm -hmm. several many years after that. Thankfully, it's worn off now, but maybe I've reignited it. Sorry, listener, if you too are being resubjected to that trauma. <laughs> there's always like a weird something in the bathwater and there's always a Ugh. shark in the pool. Yeah. I want to mention here that H.H. H. Holmes also had peepholes in his hotel. Wow. Then I want to talk about the Manor House Hotel, which was the real life setting of the quote unquote nonfiction book, The Voyeur's Motel. Wow. Written by the award winning journalist Gay Talese. We are going full true crime. We are. 
And I said hotel a minute ago, but I meant motel, the Manor <laughs> House Motel. Pretty much if you hear the word hotel in this episode, just in your head, think motel. <laughs> <laughs> The book is controversial not only because it celebrates the criminal behavior of a man who claims to have spent 30 years secretly watching people in the motel he ran in Aurora, Colorado, but also because it was later discovered that the book's subject, the voyeur, Gerald Foos, had fabricated many of the details that Gay wrote into the story without fact-checking them first. The story has been discredited on the whole, and we have no idea how much of it is actually true, but the fact remains that this voyeuristic motel did exist because Gay Talese went to the motel to see it for himself, and he claims to have put himself in the position of the voyeur, where he spent an evening watching different people having sex in the supposed privacy and secrecy of their motel rooms. Mm -hmm. This was done by installing fake air duct vents in the ceiling where there was an attic crawl space. So this man, Gerald Foos, spent his evenings crawling up and down the attic, watching people in their rooms, documenting everything about them from their gender, to their race, to their supposed profession, to what they did while they were in the rooms. He justified it by calling it research, himself the researcher, and this motel his laboratory. And he didn't own the motel for as long as he said he did, but he still had detailed notes from watching thousands of people per year from 1966 to 1997, something like 2,000 to 3,000 people per year. And if these are all real accounts, whether done at the motel or not, that's a conservative estimate of 60,000 people and potentially 90,000 liberal. That's insane. Yeah. That's absolutely insane. Absolutely freaking crazy. I'm just now thinking of all the times that I stayed in like hotels or other rentals. I always feel like there's a camera. Yeah. But there were always. years where I didn't think like... I, the thought crossed my mind, but I was like, that's far-fetched. And now I check. Mm-hmm. But there were definitely years of my adulthood that I did not. And that spooks me. So certain story elements or visuals from this episode might be inspired by a famous work of fiction, Psycho. Mm-hmm. But the most horrifying aspects, the human bones in the secret room, the voyeurism, are just as real as anything else. Yeah. And one of the best things about this show, on the whole, is that Dilworth himself wasn't just satisfied with using high-concept horror as an overarching influence. He wanted to use those quiet, secret horrors of reality Mm -hmm. that kids might know about but probably don't understand yet. You said it. People keep secrets. Some people might keep bad secrets. Some people do bad things, and they might even try to hurt you. So you have to be careful around people that you don't know very well. So to pull from some of our That's Pretty Dark lore that we've built here (laughs) over the last year and a half, when it comes to our season binges especially, Are you afraid of the dark is to latchkey kids as courage is to stranger danger. (laughs) Nice. I feel like we've had a lot of discourse, you know, online as we've begun this um, journey into Courage the Cowardly Dog specifically. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are of the mind that dark entertainment just serves to strengthen our emotional intelligence and helps us to cope. And we've (laughs) said all of these things ourselves on the show regularly. But we also, there is an intersection between chronic anxiety, anxiety disorders, like the one that I have, like the one that you have. I think there is an intersection with those things and some of this that we did consume during our, you know, (laughs) formative years. Sure. I can't, again, say that my anxiety disorder would be attributed to courage. I would not say that. I don't think you would either. I don't really think there are a lot of people who would, but I can say that it reinforced ideas that I had in my head already. I used it as ammunition uh, almost against other people. Stranger danger. It was like, okay, it could happen to courage. It could happen to me. (laughs) Yeah. Um, In my like kid logic, I should say. I think that's the other side of the coin. We say that, you know, Courage existed to show kids that they're not alone, Mm -hmm. that if he can get through it, so can they. Mm -hmm. I think the other side of that coin is that, yeah, but if this could happen to him, it could happen happen to me. me. I mean, totally right. Yeah, yeah. it's the flip side of that, like positive messaging. Mm -hmm. I think the flip side of that is that you have to accept the more harsh realities. You have to accept that these things are possible. Yeah. Yeah. I think I felt the same way as a kid. It helped me because horror for children is important because it helps kids grasp 
these larger concepts of life that are really hard to talk about, Mm -hmm. like death, like danger, that they don't always fully understand for a long time. Absolutely. And things that keep them vulnerable if they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. But this kind of thing, like courage, yes, it does alert children to the reality of these dark and dangerous things, and it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. But it also does implant concepts. It mm-hmm. also does give them ideas that they may not have may considered. Not have and that's kind of and the these, thing. This is good and bad. It's both. Yeah. You and I both, I think we approached a lot of the themes and concepts within Courage with some sort of understanding where, wherever it came from, you know, just mm-hmm. the general pop culture, yeah. films, whatever that we had seen at the time. And we were very young Incredibly. at the time, but I, I feel like. Yeah. We both approached it with a certain level of knowledge, so it reinforced ours. It wasn't really the genesis of where I understood these concepts, but I do think there are people that didn't have that going into it, Mm -hmm. that didn't have that awareness, because you and I were programmed with our anxiety disorders, I guess. It's a chicken and egg. We just It's hard to say which came first, but I do think that we both were predisposed to look for the danger, Mm -hmm. um, to look for the threat. That is something that just is encoded into both of our DNA. Mm -hmm. So this made a lot of sense to us. It did. And just affirmed us and validated us. Mm -hmm. Whereas there were probably people that approached Courage that didn't have that same foundation. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So this may have been their first introduction to fear Mm -hmm. or danger or threats on this this level. Write us, listener. Let us know. Because this is our first Courage episode. What are your experiences, you know, watching Courage? Is it coming back to you Mm -hmm. as we talk about it like it's coming back to us? That's pretty dark podcast at gmail.com. You said it. Hit us up. Well, to jump back in, Katz makes the mistake of setting a spider loose on Courage, who now realizes he has to break free from his leash so he can break back into the motel. He tries a blowtorch, a dill brand chainsaw, Uh a chemical explosion. And none of these work. But it's it's juxtaposed with the shots of the spider approaching very rapidly. Yeah, rapidly. So the, the spider <laughs> is coming, which I remembered this too. I remember that spider just like making his way, beeline time to Courage. Time is running out. Like very, very quick. And then you cut to Courage and he's got all the time in the world. He's trying a chainsaw. He's trying the explosion. <laughs> like he's got all these things uh, yeah. in, his, in his arsenal of, you know... Uh, <laughs> like resources yeah how Um, long is that porch (laughs) that's what i was thinking like (laughs) how how far does the spider actually have to travel um at that speed yeah and it also is classic like classic cartoon references Mm -hmm. immediately i feel like i'm watching looney tunes at this point absolutely um this comedic relief i think is what really kept it's the glue that kept courage running it kept Mm -hmm. courage together it kept courage on the network Um, there's always that humor there's always this dry humor that's the background for everything especially when he shoots himself through the cannon through the window <laughs> he just <laughs> yeah. hits the floor he rolls and the cannon flops. up to the window <laughs> and yep <laughs> I hope this works. because it's it's so looney tunes because it's, it's so like funny. these these items just materialize out of thin air exactly when they're needed and right the the rules of physics and logic are all out the window and then that also mm-hmm. i think is part of what helps kids feel safe yeah when they're watching it because that grounds them back in the cartoon reality and not reality, reality. You remind them that they're safe. Yeah, you remind them you that remind they're safe. You remind them it's a cartoon. Yeah, this is this is clearly a work of fiction because you've never seen somebody just produce a chainsaw out of thin air. <laughs> you know, I think that was key. Equip chainsaw. To keeping my attention, to keeping my, um, I don't know, to allowing me to continue to watch it. I don't know that I would have been able to watch something. Now, you know, yeah. obviously we do all the time, watch things that are pure drama or pure horror, mm. but I think. Well, it's a, it's a bit of levity. I mean, it. Yeah. It's a balancing act. And that's a trademark of of the show. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, what finally works is his teeth, <laughs> his dog, his crooked dog <laughs> the teeth. The one thing that he did have in, in, in reality <laughs> the, and the in the cartoon. The one real thing he actually had. <laughs> Maybe that's also a sign to children, like, you don't need to pull a chainsaw to your pocket. You already yeah, have. Yeah, I like that a lot, actually. You have what you need. Bravo. Snaps to you. Man, I just thought of that. I wasn't even <laughs> in my notes. So yeah, so he shoots himself through a cannon into the motel room through the window. <laughs> and when Muriel, who is being attacked by the spider, it's just so gross. It's so gross. In the in the bath, she's holding it with her she's legs. She's still in the bathtub. Mm-hmm. Ugh, and her feet. She tells him to go for help. And he tries to wake Eustace by blowing all these crazy horns. <laughs> and then he explodes a paper bag of air, which <laughs> yeah. I brought a prop for show and tell today. Did you? 
I feel very lucky. I'm the only one that sees it. I have a brown paper bag. We're going to see if it's loud. Oh, okay. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> it won't be loud for you on your end because you're hearing through Zoom. Let's see. Let's see how loud this is. I have to take a picture of what's happening right now. I can't get it. Hold on. Oh, there's a hole in the bag. That's not going to help. I didn't hear it at all. You didn't hear it? Not even a little bit. That was so loud. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe it peaked. Like the microphone just couldn't accept it. it. But how did Eustace not wake up? (laughs) My other thought on that. That's hilarious. Props to you and your prop, by the way. Um, Thanks. I'm proud of that. I'll post the picture and people will be like, is he having a panic attack or is he (laughs) demonstrating? (laughs) Oh, so loud. Yeah. I don't know why Courage didn't just like push him or touch him because none of these things, he didn't touch Eustace. Maybe he was afraid to. Probably. We've all been like a kid and going into our parents' room in the middle of the night, like needing help or there's a storm or whatever. And you have that moment of fear where you're like, should I do this? Should, Should I, I actually wake yeah, them up? Yeah, you don't want to like, touch them. You're like, mom. It feels weird to touch them. Dad? Yeah, you just, it's, I mean, it's a TikTok trend. Like you stand in the corner in the, in the doorway. Mom. <sighs> mom. Yeah, my dad used to fall asleep in the, in his chair in the living room. And I would go to wake him up to like tell him goodnight or whatever. Because we had to tell him goodnight for some reason. <laughs> and he would always startle awake. <gasps> oh, my mom does that you too. Know, like, <gasps> even to this day. And he would tell me how when he would go to wake up his dad, who was a World War II vet. Ooh. He would wake up with his fist up, yeah, ready to fight. You don't want that. Because he had severe PTSD. Right. So you couldn't wake him up or he would punch in the face, almost. <laughs> so he was like, at Jeez. least I don't do that. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> You're like, well, yeah, I guess it could be worse. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I'm five. so That's generational trauma. Mm-hmm. But when Courage cannot wake Eustace up, he tries to go warn motel staff by... A <laughs> doing his signature shape shifting, mm-hmm. his lassie dog shape shifting. Is Timmy in the well? Into a serpent, a dinosaur combo between a stegosaurus and a triceratops, I think. I was impressed by that one. And also apparently Dragonite, the Pokemon. Oh, we, oh my God. <laughs> I, you just triggered the visual. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Because Pokemon was also Dragonite um, airing on Toonami on Cartoon Network at this point. Mm-hmm. So there was some some network crossover there. Yeah. It was actually Dragonite, huh? It resembled Dragonite. Very pretty, closely. Pretty closely. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of like a funny off-brand name, but nothing came to me. So something from you're not getting the joke, but you're getting the idea for the joke. Something from like Digimon or whatever. Yeah, something. The knockoff. Not Dragonite. Yeah. This is when Courage discovers the spiders. Mm. Because there's a moment where the bed flips over and Eustace disappears. Yeah. Uh, when Courage goes into the office and he goes into the, bra- the back private room, he finds Eustace all wrapped up in spider webbing. Mm-hmm. He's still fast asleep. He's in the web. In the web, right. Yeah. And the spider's coming and he has to smush it and everything. By the way, this is recurring, right? That Eustace is like a heavy, heavy sleeper. Muriel too, I guess, but... Both of them, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which... That adds to the trauma. So like thinking about waking your parents up, you know, like Mm -hmm. the idea that they're, they're not going to hear you. They don't hear you. It's such a nightmare thing. The responsible people in this life don't. The people who can take care of you that you're trying to protect. Right. Will not wake up and help themselves. Right. And they can't help you. That's terrifying. And so Courage learns that Cats is behind all of it. And now there's a lot of Courage running around, screaming at everything. And this is honestly one of my favorite parts of the whole show. Just yeah. him running around screaming. <laughs> uh, I'm like, same courage. Same. Same. Yeah, that's how I approach my daily life in my office. <laughs> <laughs> running around screaming like Somebody courage. needs something from me over here. I scream in their face and run away. <laughs> <laughs> With his crooked teeth and like the hole, the mm, cavity the hole in his, in his tooth. tooth. Ooh, yeah. And he discovers Katz's room of dozens of jars of spiders lining the shelves, letting him and all of us know that no matter how many courage smushes there will always be more spiders yeah which that's the metaphor for life is it not mm-hmm. absolutely they it is. just the hits keep coming and they don't <laughs> stop coming <laughs> there's always spiders and there's always more spiders there's always <laughs> spiders and there's spiders and there's spiders there's some more spiders and there's spiders and there's spiders there's the only lyrics i know just look out for our uh, our cover yeah coming to a streaming service near you so courage runs down the hall to a dead end where Katz challenges him to a game of wall ball. 
Handball. Handball. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's exceptionally funny when Kat says, A little sport before dying, dear boy. Courage says, Do I have a choice? (laughs) It's just like so understated. Are you actually going to let me not? I have to, don't I? Like, this is how this works, right? I also loved that it was like handball or wall ball. I think I've talked about it on the show before. I'm not 100% sure. It may have gotten cut for time. This may get cut for time. Who knows? But I had a very <laughs> no, special relationship not. with wall ball growing up because mm. uh, outside my parents' church, I mean, it's just a giant brick building, right? Right. So the kids would go after services and play wall ball in the mm-hmm. back. And I was really the only girl that would play in my dress and everything. They would also get really mad if I like stopped the ball with my dress because they couldn't do that, you know? Freaking girl. Yeah, they would get very angry. I got called a lot of names, mostly just, you know, girl, you're a dumb girl, which if that's the best you can do. Wish I could wear a dress. Oh, <laughs> There you go. Man, but I played so much wall ball growing up and I just, this so, so this was just like, it clicked right into my childhood, you know, oh, yeah. like made total sense to me. For sure. Of course, they're going to have to do, you know, a match of wall ball. Of course, you got to play it Because that's how I out. would settle a dispute, you know? Right now mm-hmm. in my life when I'm however many, whatever, eight years old. I mean, we already, yeah, we saw this with uh, Courage and the Chicken from Outer Space. Yeah, there's they always a showdown. had to play like rock, paper, scissors and yeah. like chess and like <laughs> <laughs> see yes. who's, who, who wins the game. This did feel like that, didn't it? This, this mm-hmm. further lends to our theory that this is episode one. Yeah. I think. A lot of the same themes running through the pilot and this episode. Oh, yeah. And I have more reasons to to fully believe that this is episode one. Also, when Katz says the phrase over and over, by the way, through this episode, and I think multiple mm-hmm. times when he comes back, I'm not 100% on that. But when he says, uh, I wish you hadn't done that. I wish you hadn't done that. I wish you hadn't that done that. That was lodged deep, deep in my memory because it's a very, very common, like, villainous vibe it's right so that nonchalant it's very nonchalant but it's also like you're making me do this this is yes. your fault this isn't my fault i haven't done anything wrong yeah i'm only doing what you are causing me to do or making me do um it's look what you made me do mm-hmm. it absolutely i mean is. just the villain vibe um from scar and lion king referencing lion king again mm-hmm. all the way to somebody like negan in the walking dead <laughs> <laughs> christian's been hearing i've been re-watching the walking dead yeah. lately i only made it to like season six when i first or seven something when i first uh watched when it was when it was airing mm-hmm. so now i'm re-watching the walking dead nice. and uh really getting to know negan cried my eyes out the other day at a death that i knew was coming so that's where spoilers. I am emotionally in no life spoilers. right now. I didn't say who. So cats and courage play and courage loses. And of course, all this time, Muriel is still fending off the spider in the bathtub. The whole Which time. is just so disgustingly trying to bite her face with its squishy, drooling pincer mouth. Yeah. Ugh. And its spindly legs. I hate all the words you just said. I hate all mm. of them. <laughs> Me too. I hate that I wrote them down. <laughs> but she ultimately saves herself by flushing that spider down the toilet and rescuing courage from cats using a racket, which TV Tropes calls big damn heroes. Like something big squashes something small. That's pretty funny. And she like uses the racket to, yeah. It's like a badminton or like a tennis racket. Like, Well, it's like a squash racket. Or squash. It's racquetball, which is basically handball. It's wall ball. Yeah, racquetball. Duh. So it's funny that they don't use rackets, but then she uses a racket. Isn't that weird? <laughs> but yeah, it's the, and again, the same Looney Tunes, like kind of seeing stars moment where mm-hmm. he's just like, oh. And falls over. Yep. Reminds me of uh, Ella Enchanted when the evil uncle gets poisoned and falls over. Just <laughs> stiffens up and falls over. Common trope. Common trope. And next we see them. Muriel is driving them all home. Eustace is still asleep and bundled up in his spider webbing, which Muriel calls a fancy blanket. But I want to take a step back to the moment just before Muriel stops Cats. He has courage by the neck. Choking him. Pinning him down to the floor. And holding out a spider that he's going to use to kill Courage. Just straight up, like, which it's, and it lasts a, like, a, a weirdly him. long time, that frame, where he's just got his hand around Courage's neck. That's common. I think, I think Courage is strangled a lot mm-hmm. throughout. He is in the first two episodes. Quick si- yeah, he is strangled in both of these first two episodes, which quick sidebar, like trauma to the throat or um, mm-hmm. diseases of the throat, all things like that, mm-hmm. all point back to trauma where you don't feel heard or you don't feel like you have a voice. That's where, like, your body stores the trauma. 
Oh, is that what I have? Why my voice yes. is so weird and I get uh-huh. raspy all the time? Yeah. Like tonight? And I have thyroid disease. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. It's pretty weird when you think about it in those terms. But yeah, courage is constantly being strangled. And I feel like that's almost metaphoric for the way that he has no voice. No one ever hears him and he screams and he tries. Oh, yeah. And no one ever hears him. Oh, yeah. It's something that we will continue to unpack. <laughs> Kat says to Courage. Now you're going to learn why no one ever checks out of the cat's motel. That's it. This is an incredibly dark and frightening line to have in a children's cartoon, especially after seeing everything that's happened and knowing that no matter where you are in this motel, you're being watched, you're in danger, and seemingly no one is coming to help you. Mm -mm. And then Katz delivers this line that almost doesn't need to be said. It's obvious right? Mm -hmm. You check in and he feeds you to his spiders. You don't get to go home. No. No one ever leaves the cat's motel. TV Tropes calls this the inn of no return. Mm -hmm. But this calls to mind another motel slash hotel of pop culture lore that once you check in, you can never leave. This is where all of my conjecture begins. But I think I'm on to something here. I'm here for it. The cat's motel isn't just a play on the Bates Motel. It's a reference to Hotel California Mm. by the Eagles. Nice. One of the most haunting songs to come out of that era of music history. Mm -hmm. It's all about a weary traveler who stops for a rest at some Eldritch Hotel. Yes. Only to discover that they have to stay forever. I love this. The last line is, you can check out anytime you like. But you can never leave. But you can never leave. This song is considered one of the most famous critiques of not only the music and entertainment industries in California, but of American culture itself. In a text called Encyclopedia of Great Popular Song Recordings, Volume 2. I want that. (laughs) Steve Sullivan said the song represents, quoting, American decadence and burnout. Mm -hmm. Too much money, corruption, drugs, and arrogance. Too little humility in heart. Mm -hmm. In Volume 13... Of Performing Songwriter Magazine, Bill DeMaine wrote an article called Rock's Greatest Urban Legends, in which he described the Hotel California as an allegory about hedonism, self-destruction, and greed in the music industry of the 1970s. Something that just consumes you from the inside out. And of course, there are many allusions to drugs and alcohol in the song, which seems to represent the firm grip or the hold or the enchanting sort of go ask Alice aspect of the hotel that keeps you too incoherent or too strung out to find a way to escape that particular hell. Mm -hmm. And also telling, one of the founding members of the Eagles, Don Henley, said in an interview with Rolling Stone, that it's a song about loss of innocence. Mm -hmm. In a documentary called The History of the Eagles, Don Henley has a quote I could not love more. He said, The hotel itself could be taken as a metaphor for not only the myth-making of Southern California, but for the myth-making that is the American dream, because it is a fine line between the American dream and the American nightmare. Damn. And with the combination of the loss of innocence and the American nightmare... I have a hard time believing John Dilworth didn't completely intend for his Cat's Motel to be the first segment of the very first episode. His American dream was finally beginning. It was finally being realized. And if we know anything about him now, after Kaylin's exploration of his character and his out-of-this-world thought processes Mm -hmm. and our introduction to the Courage series. Make sure you catch that if you haven't, because there's a lot to it that continues to matter. (laughs) I think it checks out, pun intended, that he was doing a lot of thinking about his own life, about how his own life was about to be wrapped up real tight in that sort of Californian decadence found within the American mythos, Mm -hmm. perhaps using a piece of his own personal apprehension or fear of the future to lay in a baseline for the continuation of courage as a series on the whole, Mm -hmm. saying, beware, children, of your own innocence, for we are beginning a journey that very few return from unscathed. Wow. Either that, or he once stayed in a super creepy motel and there was a spider in the bathtub and there were (laughs) feral cats outside running around eating rats or something. With John Dilworth, you really never know. You never know. I think that's part of the reason why he is such a prolific and interesting creative Mm -hmm. is that you have no idea if it's just a one-off instance in his life that he thought was interesting or funny or strange and wrote about it. Mm -hmm. Or... 
as you just so beautifully described, <laughs> Thank you. something going on in his psyche that he wanted to let out. Mm -hmm. You never know with him. You never it's know. a total toss up. And I think it that's- It could be both. It could be I neither. Mean, there aren't a lot of people like him like that. He's one of a kind, it seems like. For sure. I don't know. But when I started to look into Hotel California, I was like, well, damn, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> I I'm, This is also the song that is supposedly demonic if played backwards. Yes. Is it this one? Yes. Right? Let's. I don't confirm. think it's Hotel California. I'm pretty sure it is. I think it's Stairway to Heaven, right? Or is it? Mm -mm. Play it backwards. Are diabolical messages hidden? Is Hotel California a creepy song? The true meaning of Hotel California. Wait, did you put Hotel California in your search? Mm -hmm. See, when, you, when I Google without that, Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven played backwards as demonic. I think there are many. <laughs> this is the satanic panic, right? This is the era of... Smells like teen spirit is also one of them, apparently. Mm -hmm. This site that I see says, for example, with the super hit Hotel California by the Eagles, when played in reverse, the secret message says, Satan, he hears this. He had me believe. <laughs> that's so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, see, that's just part of the American folklore. That's what I was about to Rock say. Rock and roll folklore. The satanic panic like of the time, the idea that this rock and roll lifestyle, like you described, you know, this, uh, the American decadence, this yeah. is going to steal your soul. It does, but it's just not Satan stealing your soul. Right. It's different people. So in cases like this, I feel like there are people who, you know, people that were behind the movement, the satanic panic movement, people that are mm. looking for these evil things in pop culture. Yeah. You know, there's an element of truth to it, right? Like you said, like this, this culture can eat you from the inside out if you're not careful. Oh, sure. These vices can destroy you if you're not mm -hmm. careful. So there's all of that truth to it. And I That's, think- Yeah, that is the metaphor of quote unquote selling your soul. Right. Is giving up- exactly. Exactly. A lot of things to pursue greatness. I think there's a grain yeah. of that idea in the satanic panic, because although True. as we've learned on this show and as we will continue to talk about, because it was so prevalent in the 80s and 90s, the satanic panic, while completely fabricated, totally. completely, <laughs> with absolutely no substantial evidence, the, the main uh, proponents of the satanic panic were lying. Oh, absolutely. Straight up and making things the up. People who claim to be part of all the satanic bullshit were making it up entirely. Yeah, entirely. They were lies. Uh, it was it was based on lies, but I do mm -hmm. think it's interesting and I think it was based in that little grain of truth. It's almost like the, you know, the confirmation bias of what they were looking for. They just latched onto that aspect of culture mm -hmm. and used it for their own rhetoric. Yeah. They took something that had a foundation in reality mm -hmm. and they made it fantastic yes. and fictional. Yeah. They gave it this flair of supernatural. That yes, it didn't they need. added, correct, correct. They added the supernatural element to that real, mm -hmm. you know, danger, I guess. I mean, no one, yeah, definitely nobody is arguing that the music industry and the entertainment industry in America isn't corrupt as hell. No, absolutely Everyone not. who's in it knows that for a fact. Mm -hmm. And this is why, like, the Eagles, for example, wrote a lot of their music because they wanted to mm -hmm. talk about how as soon as they got a taste of that fame, of that fortune, of knowing what the industry was truly like... They didn't like what they saw. Right. It began to change them. And this is why most albums after your first or second album aren't that good for most bands, <laughs> at least nowadays, yeah. because you get thrown into that life mm -hmm. of decadence. I think that what is so strange to me is that if these folks behind, you know, oh no, it's satanic, play it backwards, rock music's evil, rock music will kill you, yada, yada. <laughs> if the people behind that could take an honest look at the media for what it is and mm -hmm. not put their own need to be right or need to have that like supernatural backing or whatever it is that that to, is, to satisfy their own fear their exactly, own fear of the yes, world this fear yeah. of the world that they have if they just took a second and honestly examined the media that they have a problem with mm -hmm. this is true of a lot of horror by the way you guys like true of a lot of horror films true of a lot of uh, Stephen King, even mm -hmm. if these people would take a step back, I think that they would realize that the media is saying the same thing they are saying. Yeah. It's exposing the danger. It's exposing yes. that reality. They can't see past the scary images to actually get to the point the of point the content. The point of a lot of this stuff is the same point that they're making that these things are dangerous or that you mm -hmm. need to be aware. There needs to be an awareness or a respect or whatever. Not to say that they're saying exactly the same thing, but you know what I mean? Like They're making the same points. It's just so interesting to me that they're making yeah. similar points if they would just step back, get over themselves for just a second and like mm -hmm. examine it 
objectively, yeah, they might find more in common with it than differences. Absolutely. You're hitting the nail on the freaking head. Mm. It took me a long time to like figure out the words to say, but like. <laughs> but they're, they're looking at the scary images and they're saying, you're condoning all this evil. You're condoning fear and, you know, horror and like all this stuff. You're and letting it's like, these evil. I mean, we see it all the time, right? You see it in viral like Facebook posts about, oh, what was it? There was a horror movie recently. Oh, the black phone. Yeah. Maybe. Mm-hmm. There was there was a viral Facebook post, not to belittle anyone's belief systems. Like obviously we all come into this yep. world with trauma. We experience trauma. We have our own reasons for believing the things that we do. So I I don't mean to speak ill. But what I will say is that there was a whole viral Facebook post about this movie, The Black Phone, mm-hmm. and about how the movie itself was demonic. And if you watch it in your house, it's gonna invite demons into your home, into your life. And <sighs> That's you don't need news. to put that in front of your you know, like, yeah, that that's been true said. I felt said that way since I was seven years old watching scary movies. Right. You can invite those demons You're into your home. inviting it in. When in reality, if you watch something like The Black Phone, the whole critique is on the evil in humanity. Yeah. And how we react and manage it. Like react yeah. to and manage it. Like how the world reacts to it. It's, it's about exposing the evil, not mm-hmm. inviting the evil. I know. I mean, you're, yeah, you're preaching I'm to the preaching choir the here. preaching the choir. Listener, Listen. do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> this is a soapbox that we really haven't gotten to get onto yet. And I love that it's courage that's, that's sparking that for us. I'm glad too. I feel like this is something I talk about a lot because I do like to write this kind of stuff. And when people find out that I like to write, I like to create things and they go, oh, what do you, what do you like to write about? Mm-hmm. And I have to find really clever, new and interesting ways to say that I like to write horror. Yeah. Because nobody wants to hear that you write horror. No, they're turned off. they're like, oh, what do you mean? They think I'm creepy. Why? They, yeah. Because everybody has their own idea of what horror, of what horror is. horror is. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's always the thing behind the door. It's the thing that they imagine to be horror. Right. Not actually what horror is. Horror is broad. Right. Horror is one of the most, it's one of the broadest genres out there. 100%. Everything else fits into a very specific niche corner. Horror is a landscape. But you have to also consider that regardless of if they they absorb it or believe it, there are also all of those like weird viral Facebook posts and weird like Mm -hmm. internet theories and weird, if you play it backwards, Satan talks to you. Like all of that weird stuff is in everybody's subconscious too, because we exist in the world. There's a lot to this. So the judgment of it is problematic because they miss the point. The judgment and the knee-jerk reactions to it is problematic because we're all making the same points. Bad stuff is bad. There's no denying that. (laughs) (laughs) We're all saying it. We just look different. Yeah. I wish more people realized it. Me too. If there's one takeaway (laughs) from this episode today, listener, is that just because someone is different than you are, that does not make them wrong. But don't trust strangers. <laughs> Man, that was some good discourse. I feel, yeah, I feel really good about uncovering that at the root of mm-hmm. America's perception of horror. Thanks, Dilly. Thank you, Dilly. Thanks for doing us a dally. <laughs> I will say they really bake Eustace and Mario's like obliviousness into the very beginning of this show. Oh, that is, is one of the tenets that the in. show is based on. Yeah. Because they just kind of are, are completely unaware that of all the things that Kurt just went through. And they're like, let's go home. And they just leave. Yeah. Which, speaking of obliviousness, that's going to lead us into Cajun Dreams, too. <laughs> let me tell you. If there's anything truly connecting the Cats Motel to uh, g- Granny Stew, it's used to Samuriel's ability to sleep with such goddamn reckless abandon. I... <laughs> I wish I had that ability. Pretty sure they're both <laughs> severely narcoleptic, but yeah, I wish I had what they had. Yeah. Even just last night, I'm lying there in bed trying to sleep and I'm like thinking about how easily the bags can just <laughs> fall asleep. They can anywhere. I'm like counting courage dogs. Yeah. Jumping over windmills and stuff. <laughs> counting my sheep. I, I, I'm jealous. I don't want narcolepsy. Let's just not put that into the universe. Nope. However, it would be nice to just be able to go to sleep when I lay down at night. Yeah, you can do that without having narcolepsy. You sure can. Lots mm-hmm. of people do it. Most, in people fact. People do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> not me. How? Not me either. Not me. The listeners are like, it's because you watch so much horror. <laughs> it's not. I'm not lying awake <laughs> thinking about scary stuff. No, me neither. My mind's just going a million miles an hour. I'm thinking Same. about everything I have to it's, do tomorrow. It isn't the horror, listener. It's our ADHD. It's just my brain. It never turns off. It's a nope. freaking tornado. Yeah, same. So if you're sad that we're saying goodbye to cats for now, fret not. 
because he is a recurring villain. He is. On Courage. One of my most remembered. Me too. The most memorable to Kalen villains. I like his voice. Me too. I, lo- I love his voice. His voice is strangely attractive, as terrible as he is. <laughs> and this is, <sighs> you know, a problem for a lot of people. Well, that's um, Paul Schoeffler. <laughs> I, I'm excited to compare and Shuffler. contrast villain voices of Paul Shuffler now. Me too. Can't well, wait. Well, let's do it with the Cajun Fox. We shall. When a Cajun Fox realizes he's missing the main ingredient for a prize-winning granny stew, the granny, <laughs> he goes out on the hunt where he finds Courage and Muriel enjoying a nice day at the park. Well, Muriel's having a nice day. Courage is afraid of the pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid of pigeons, too, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to talk about all about your fear of birds in a second. <laughs> okay, good. I don't know. I, I just, I don't. You're not afraid of them? What's the word? I don't sympathize. No. After Muriel falls asleep, Courage and the Cajun Fox engage in a similar sort of Olympic battle of wits that we got a mere taste of between Courage and the chicken from outer space, employing Looney Tunes-like slapstick violence yes. in their equal so much. yet adverse attempts to get the granny. This episode opens with the Cajun Fox preparing the ingredients for his boiling pot of stew. And yet again, his voice is the one thing that I do remember. This is gonna be good. What? 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 (laughs) He's doing this while reading from a book called Food Good to Eat. (laughs) And he's attempting... I saw that too. He's attempting to make a prize-winning pot of granny stew. Mm -hmm. The ingredients thus far are a cup of lizard lips. Mm-hmm. Lizards don't have lips. A pair of elephant ankles. Elephants don't have ankles. And a tablespoon of turtle eyes. Turtles do have eyes. A tablespoon of turtle eyes. <laughs> mm-hmm. The hills and the turtles, they have eyes. <laughs> Good reference. Thanks. Terrible movies. Yeah. Um, speaking of terrible eyes, though, the reveal of the kid yeah. in Fox's <laughs> eyes. Crazy Fox eyes. Yeah. Oh, my God. They're pretty googly. Terrifying to me. As a child. They're pretty ooga booga booga. They are googly. They're pretty googly. <laughs> so, okay. This is just a really funny poke at Cajun cuisine, mm-hmm. which isn't all that weird to us living here in the American South. No. But I can see where someone who isn't from here would find it pretty strange. Mm-hmm. So I made a list of things that are specifically associated with Louisiana food. Hey, I like me some Louisiana food. I like some of it. I'm a Cajun food person, 100%. Seafood. There's mm. crawfish and shrimp. Mm, I love crawfish. Which you shrimp. love crawfish. I love crawfish, y'all. <laughs> Everybody I know loves crawfish. I can't stand crawfish. Mm. And you can either boil these, like a crawfish boil, shrimp boil, mm-hmm. or some crawfish etouffee. And when you have these boils, by the way, like if you're not from mm. here and you have a crawfish boil or shrimp boil, it's like vegetables in the pot, like potatoes, corn, um, all the fixins that go with it. And then obviously like all the, the potatoes. spices and everything. I like the potatoes. Yeah, you, you're a potato You're a potato person. You're a potato I, man. I am a potato person. <laughs> it's all like Cajun food is spicy, but more than that, it's just really well seasoned. Yes. Very thoroughly seasoned food. Mm-hmm. It's just so Which good. is why I love oh, it. Oh, there's so much flavor. Mm. There's also jambalaya. Mm. There's boudin mm. and andouille mm. sausages. I love some boudin mm, sausage. Me too. Mm, boudin ball. Po boys. Po boys. Dirty rice. Muffalata sandwich. Mm-hmm. Um, red beans and rice, a staple of mine. Yeah. Alligator. Tastes just like chicken. Tasso, which is like pork shoulder. Mm-hmm. And frog's legs, which also tastes just like chicken. We're, bo- we're both hungry right now. <laughs> I'm so hungry. Yeah. The same rule applies. Like, don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. Don't record a podcast <laughs> when you're hungry. That's all I do. <laughs> I think I was hungry earlier while I was writing these notes. This is not today. an uncommon state to find Christian yeah. in, listener, is the state of being just absolutely starving. Mm, this is true. Been this way since I was a kid. <laughs> but I dated a Cajun girl for- I was waiting for, for you to bring it up, yeah. <laughs> about six years. So you're, you're very familiar. I was introduced to a lot of this food through her and her family. Mm-hmm. I really wish I'd gotten her mom's gumbo recipe mm. because my god that was the best thing i'd ever eaten wow. so gumbo, gumbo yeah that's a classic cajun food it's like the staple food of louisiana yeah. and gumbo. honestly that's really i th- i think that's what this intends to play on but a lot more people are familiar with the concept of stew hey well i'm gonna talk about fox stew in a little while okay well really right here <laughs> but can i also say 
I feel like this is also a play on a witch's brew. Yeah. Serpent, spider's tale of a rat, you know? Yeah. Calling mm-hmm. the spirits wherever they're at kind of vibe. <laughs> I think- Or like Dead Man's Toe from Hocus Pocus. Dead Man's Toe, Dead Man's Toe. I think we're all really familiar, like um, sugar and spice and everything nice, or mm-hmm. what is it that boys are made of? Rats and snails and puppy dogs' tails? Yeah, yeah. I think that there's an element of that, like- very old, old world, like witch lore mm-hmm. in this culture and this sure. cultural like idea. Well, I mean, the swamp witch, right? It's a common Louisiana thing, or like yeah. the witch doctor kind of voodoo, witch doctor. Mm-hmm. you know, potions, potion, yeah, mixing type it of up. thing. Yeah, that yeah. was what I, I think it's all ingrained, it's all mixed drew in from for this episode. I think that was kind of the horror tie, it's all stirred into that pot. Um, beyond just the folklore idea that you're going to be eaten in a stew. Mm-hmm. The Hansel and Gretel effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had to steer away from like cannibalism because he's a fox. Sure. You know what I mean? So it's not cannibalism to him. It's not cannibalism. <laughs> when it comes to rural living or country living anywhere in the world, the stereotype is that people eat whatever is there and available. And that's true. People will eat pretty much anything to survive. And no, like I said, I'm not going to get into cannibalism <laughs> as much as I want to. But I just think it's funny that this has become part of our cultural understanding of the American South, considering that it's generally associated with country living, which has bred a stereotypical association between the South and eating strange things. Mm -hmm. And since Louisiana is specifically known for its eclectic mix of Cajun and Creole cuisine, it makes so much sense to me that Dilworth would make the fox Cajun. Of course. Since in reality, it could very easily be the inverse. Mm Mm-hmm. That a Cajun granny is making a fox Fox stew. stew. Mm. So hunting foxes is nothing new. And for some reason, it's a very common plot line in children's entertainment. From things like Fox and the Ham. Yes. And the Hungry Hounds episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark that we covered. Uh Mon Petit Rouge. (laughs) Mon Petit Rouge. Mon Petit Rouge. But usually it's either for sport, for the pelts, or because foxes are pests. But rarely would it be for the meat. Mm -hmm. But it stands to reason that if you were hunting foxes for their meat, you're probably living some sort of country lifestyle where you kill what you eat and you eat what you kill. Daryl Dixon. Mm. What? (laughs) Walking Dead. Oh, I I told you I'm on a Walking Dead binge. But having said all of this, (laughs) considering how excited Muriel gets about the fox stew at the end of the episode... I wonder if the idea of fox stew didn't come to Dilworth from his dear Scottish friend Muriel, who inspired the character of Muriel. Yeah, we talked about that in our introduction. Considering that foxes are one of Scotland's most common mammals and can be found in almost every habitat in Scotland. Wow. Who knows? I wouldn't have considered that. I just, you know, just a thought. More conjecture. I have no idea. That's what we're here to do is conjecture. So what's the weirdest thing that you've ever eaten? Mm. Or the weirdest place? Like what's like... What's like the weirdest food situation you've ever been in? I would say a pub in Hamburg, Germany, Hamburg, Germany. Okay. Uh, where they served like you would imagine like a um like a Caesar salad hmm. with chicken. They served their salad with kangaroo. Oh. It was it was an Australian pub. I should have mentioned that in Germany. But yeah, they served their salad with kangaroo and I did try kangaroo. How was it? Tasted like chicken. There you go. <laughs> it really did. Everything I mean, just tastes like chicken. It was because that's what we're, you know, what we're familiar with, right? But what is the weirdest food situation that you've ever been in? So years ago, I was traveling up to the Moundville Archaeological <laughs> Park up near Tuscaloosa mm-hmm. to research the Indian mounds up there for uh, <laughs> a magazine. A magazine that I was an editor for at the time. Mm-hmm. And on the way back, I was hungry. So I stopped at a restaurant called. Here, kitty, kitty. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> it was a little shack, a little hole in the wall, hole in the woods oh, no. uh, in the middle of nowhere in Alabama. I'm very afraid of what you're going to say. And behind it was the visible catfish pond. Okay. Catfish. I like catfish. Here, kitty, kitty. I like that. Here, okay. catfish, catfish. That's funny. I didn't trust the catfish, so I got the burger. <laughs> but the catfish pond, I could see the house up the hill. It was yeah. very psycho. And it was like... I don't want whatever catfish you have to give me. <laughs> Honestly, I, I might eat. trust the catfish more because you see where that came from. I mean, I guess so, but beef is beef. Yeah. Everything else tastes like chicken. <laughs> it was fine. It was a fine meal, but I was a little scared of what I was going to be served. 
Yeah, that that's all I'm that's saying. Nerve wracking. Listeners, send us your weird food stories. This is not a tangent we often go on. To be yeah. honest, this is not something that we find ourselves talking about very often. So I'm super curious to know what people's weirdest food stories Bonus are. Bonus points if it happened to you in the '90s. Wow. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I want to make another note of a local restaurant around here that I'm not going to give the name of. Uh oh. But when I first heard about this this restaurant, it was accompanied with a I don't know if it was like a local legend or a rumor, but the story is. They will cook any meat you bring in. No. Oh, no. No questions asked. I don't like that. Anything. No, thank you. Now that we're all thoroughly grossed out. Yep. Let's break down the specifics of this episode. Definitely. So the Cajun fox goes looking for a granny, and he finds Muriel and Courage at the park. Oh, Courage, isn't it grand to feed the birds? Muriel is feeding the birds, and Courage says he doesn't like them because they always make fun of him, (laughs) which they begin doing immediately yeah pointing at him laughing at him i have two big thoughts here but you were going to mention something earlier oh well whenever i first saw the pigeons like Hmm. it looked like they had like blue ribbons around their necks or something like blue bandanas almost yeah it just had a strange look about it to me yeah that seems right it triggered a memory of those whatever they were, I don't know, different vessels that every grandma of the 80s and 90s had in her kitchen. Yeah. They just wanted to decorate their space with those uh, ducks with the blue bonnets on. Mm. Do you remember those? Yeah, that rings a bell. That's what they looked like to me. And I didn't know if it was intentional or not. But I wouldn't put it past somebody like John Dilworth. To like work that To have that weird little pop culture like at the time. I want to see a picture of of these blue bonnet ducks. I can help you out. Oh, yeah. Remember them? Look at that goose. Yeah, the geese. Maybe they're geese. <laughs> they're geese. Country geese. I've been talking about it all wrong. Country geese. Yep. Pretty sure this was in my mama's kitchen. <laughs> yeah. That does look familiar. <laughs> How did we all oh, have the same experience? I wonder if my grandmother had one of those. <laughs> oh, my Jeez. God. These cups. <gasps> Whoa. Yeah. That I rings just a had bell. Like a, oh, I have seen those. Wow. I just, that triggered a like full on nostalgia trip. That's crazy. Okay, here's, here's another example of the... Um, yeah, okay, that's just some Mother Goose shit right there. I know, it is very Mother Goose, um, Mother yep. Goose core, as the kids would say. Mother Goose core? Mm-hmm. It sounds like porn. <laughs> Ew. Why? <laughs> Why is it called Mother Goose core? No, they wouldn't say that, they would just you say that, like, you, you know. You seen that Mother Goose core porn? Oh, cottage core. The cottage core porn? No, you know, I not actually porn. Found out, you know what I found out recently? Oh, I'm when scared I'm, I'm making to so find many dis- out what you found out recently. <laughs> I'm making so many discoveries about myself. <laughs> Nothing to do with goose porn. <laughs> but, <laughs> Are you but, sure? Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, learning the new terminology that these crazy kids are coming up with these days, mm-hmm. I am a perfect combination between cottage core Mm-hmm. And uh, dark academia. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> First thought. I love how this show constantly does this thing where courage seems to be the only one experiencing the very obvious thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. Like Muriel and Eustace seem to rarely fully acknowledge that the thing is actually happening. This is how it feels to be a person. <laughs> we think everything we feel is so obvious to yeah. everyone else. Yes. Like, you think everyone can see how nervous or insecure you are. Absolutely. That they're judging you. Mm -hmm. This is the root of not only paranoia and anxiety, but also imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. When we assume that other people can see right through us. Yes. And that they know without a doubt that we don't belong here. Mm -hmm. This is reflected in Courage as a character over and over again. Oh my God. So good. Courage doesn't like birds because they always make fun of him. (laughs) At first, this seems silly, right? We're laughing about it. I hit my microphone. I was laughing. (laughs) But then we see the birds making fun of him. Yeah. And it's no longer... In his head. Funny. It's funny. But it's no longer funny because we see it. Mm -hmm. Courage sees it. But Muriel doesn't see it. Doesn't see it. It exemplifies that childhood desperation to get an adult to listen to you. Absolutely. Or understand you. Or even see you. When you know they don't. Mm -hmm. That's how it felt to be a kid. It is. And that's often how it feels to be an adult. Uh, I'm not going to argue. And if we will notice... When the birds are pointing and laughing at Courage, we see them from Courage's point of view, his perspective, and it looks like they're pointing and laughing at us. Yes. So in such a simple way, experiencing these birds making fun of us gets us primed and ready to explore a genuine expression of what it feels like to struggle with mental health. Wow. To 
be neurodivergent, to feel seemingly fundamentally different, different mm-hmm. from other people. Wow. I thought it would take us a couple episodes, honestly, to get to that element of courage. No. And we have arrived. The pigeons did it to us. They did. To courage. To us. To Dilly. To Dilly. And I've always felt this way, and I still feel this way a lot of the time. It's just incredible to me that they did it so like effortlessly. Mm -hmm. But my second thought, John Dilworth must have a thing about birds, (laughs) about fowl. Honestly, yeah. Evil fowl. Evil fowl. Will continue as a theme throughout Courage, the Cowardly Dog. And I do wonder if it influenced my own fear (laughs) of fowl. This is where I knew you would talk about this. Because all the ones we see are scary. They're all pretty evil. Yeah, I don't think there's a good bird to be found. Mm -mm. You can't keep a good dog down, but There are no good birds to speak of. You know what? Wise words. (laughs) I'm making an all dogs reference about Courage the Cowardly (laughs) Dog, and we're talking about birds. Stop trying to make fetch happen. I'm just talking about fried chicken. And catfish. Here, kitty, kitty. And not only this, but the bulk of the cat's motel is clearly based on the Bates Motel, Mm -hmm. in which Hitchcock decorated the walls of the motel with bird art. And the whole room behind the main office is filled with Norman's bird taxidermy. It is. And that whole scene I in there forgot about that. Is dedicated to a conversation between Norman and Marion about how birds actually eat a lot more than you'd think they would. Oh. That they are <laughs> predators in disguise. I hate it. Because they are beautiful I hate it. and delicate and unexpected. No. <laughs> Not to mention another Hitchcock classic The Birds. Birds. <laughs> I'm just saying. Wow. You're really proud of that. I don't aren't know you? what I'm saying. I'm just saying. I can saying. tell. It's a, it's a very interesting intersection. I will agree with you there. I'm just saying. <laughs> I rest my. The defense rests. <laughs> the defense rests its case. But the prosecution must go on. Mm. The setting of this episode is nothing like I remember from Courage at all. Usually it's either the desert mm-hmm. or in one of the nearby towns. Mm-hmm. This is a green, lush oasis. I thought the same thing. I was like, where are they? This doesn't look like nowhere that we know of. It's somewhere else. (laughs) (laughs) It's not nowhere. It's somewhere else. They're at the park with this ornate fountain with a marble statue. Mm -hmm. There are birds eating the seeds that Muriel's feeding them. And eventually we deal with the edge of the cliff overlooking this enormous canyon below. Mm Mm-hmm. Which is a direct reference to Looney Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner cartoons. Yeah. This is when things get super Looney Toony. Muriel falls asleep and the fox steals her away from courage. And for the rest of the episode, they play an incredibly extreme game of Gimme Dad Granny. <laughs> AKA Keep Away. And TV Tropes calls this an affectionate parody. I think they called it, Hmm. and it's a parody of Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. So I think all of this is because of courage coming from What a Cartoon, which was designed to mimic the style of Looney Tunes and the Merry Melodies cartoons, Mm -hmm. which we discussed at length in our Intro to Courage series. And I think it's either Dilworth seizing this opportunity to fulfill a dream of making a classic cartoon Mm -hmm. that he grew up with, Mm -hmm. or the network saying that they wanted an episode like this Mm -hmm. to hook viewers with that familiar nostalgia yeah, that Cartoon Network was banking on at the time. I can see both of those elements at play, Mm -hmm. I think. Just nonsensical slapstick violence. Mm -hmm. Thrown into the fountain, slapped with a salami, (laughs) smacked with a car door, blown up with a bomb, Mm -hmm. smushed by a steamroller, Mm -hmm. twice, (laughs) plummet from a cliff's edge. There's lots of falling from the sky in this one. Lots of falling. Including Courage being smushed by Muriel falling from the sky. Mm -hmm. Punched by a giant boxing glove. Beaten with a nightstick. uh, The fox as the cop, which you you mentioned something about calling for help. Mm -hmm. And the police just like couldn't care less. Calling for help. Yeah. Like that that whole moment of like calling 911, which Courage often goes to the computer, goes, seeks Mm. help. He seeks help. And that... Like, blasé, like, eh, they'll get there when they get there. Like, bored. the board, the boredom mm-hmm. of that operator, that theme carries through for yeah. the entire run of the show, really. Mm-hmm. And it's scary in life to imagine. It's so Like, scary. the people that you call for help couldn't be bothered. I mean, how many you. times have we needed something to happen and people are just like, eh, eh. 
they give you like the runaround, like we'll call mm-hmm. this number and they'll help oh, you, and then man. and then they say, well, actually, you got to speak to insurance, so and so, fighting with really any system me about in America it. right now. <laughs> Telling me about it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but it better be good. I don't know what I'm going to do, but it better be good. Strangled in the cockpit. More strangling. Mm -hmm. A plane crash into a cliffside, Mm -hmm. after which they're burnt crispy. The burnt crispy trope. Very common as well. And then Courage's final plummet from the summit. Sounds like a theme park ride. The summit plummet. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a a water park. It is a water park ride. It's at uh, Typhoon Lagoon or Blizzard Beach. The summit plummet? Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Man, how do I not have a million dollars? The ideas I have. Because <laughs> other people make them. That's why. When I don't. I sit in my office and record podcasts <laughs> and write stories. The only, the only thing missing from this is one of them stepping on a rake or a loose plank of wood and getting smacked in the face with I it. I thought about that, yeah. It has everything else. This is really before they, I feel like they do take it up a notch in later episodes with the violence of courage, but- for now, they really stick to that slapstick classic style. Nothing too crazy. But I mean, we just got past like bones in a dark room, you mm-hmm. know, and like <laughs> spiders eating you. So I, mm-hmm. it's like, I it's don't a, know. And it's a contrast, right? Like those two episodes, They're you do different. feel a contrast with them. You go from horror to Looney Tunes. Yeah. And it's the same show. Mm-hmm. Crazy. This fox's eyes are pretty horrific though. <laughs> <laughs> just go, always goes back Ooh. to those googly eyes. So next, I have a breakdown of the sexual slash mature undertones. Okay, of this, I have some notes on this. Although I do want to say as well before we get into this, because I do think his voice has a lot to do with it. Yeah, obviously, this is the same actor doing his Cajun accent now Mm -hmm. as the Fox, but they both have this very dry, even keel way of speaking. Cats Mm -hmm. and the fox. Yeah. This is something we've talked about in previous episodes as being very unsettling to children because the tone does not match with the nature of the villain. And I really, (laughs) I liked, I don't remember which violent act that Courage has done to the fox when he says it, but at one point the fox says, Now I do take offense, sir. I do. <laughs> and it just, I, I laughed out loud. I was like, that's funny. Like, that's funny. That's good. That's written well and that's funny. It is funny. And, and it's quotable. It's really quotable. I do take offense. I do take it's offense. It's very slow and calculated. Additionally, this entire time that we've been discussing all of this craziness happening, Muriel is just going, honk shoe, like totally <laughs> asleep. Way, Completely way asleep. Reckless abandon. I'm telling you. <laughs> If only I could achieve this on any given night, I'd be a different person. You would. Transformed. We all would. It'd be a miracle. <laughs> so when the fox first sees Muriel, he says, Now that's what I call one cute little old granny. Mm-hmm. And it's not Ugh. that weird at first, but it just sort of continues to roll downhill mm-hmm. on inappropriate things to say. Yeah. And I think they just started to kind of... Predatory. Yeah, predatory. I think they kind of just started pushing the limit of sort of what they could imply. Mm-hmm. It goes from predatory to sexually predatory. Mm-hmm. But we know the end result is just to cook her and eat her. Sure. And so it's it's just, it, you know, I just, you know, it's weird. I was struck and by it. I, I don't want to dive too much into it and like- Make it make weird. A, I don't want to make it we weird. We don't intend to make it weird, but the it's the tone. Well, also, I don't know if kids would really get it anyway. And that's the other thing. is that They're not thinking that. Kids aren't thinking that way. So how much of this is written for the adults that are going to watch it? Because we talked about that too before. Like, what was their target demographic? Yeah. And we've talked about how Cartoon Network did cater a lot to adults as well. Yeah. And so I think it would be, as a kid, I wouldn't have ever thought twice about the phrasing of certain things. But watching this as an adult, I was like... Did he just say that? Mm-hmm. The, specifically, the line that got me was, Just risk your head, my darling. Leave everything to me. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh. Yep. And those could either be the nicest, most soothing words, <laughs> or the most disgusting, predatory thing you've ever heard, depending on the context. The fine line is, are you attractive or not? Yes. Mm-hmm. Sadly, if they find you attractive, it's charming. It's charming. If they find you unattractive, yep. it's creepy. Yep. This it, it. it reminds me a lot of the How I Met Your Mother episode. Which one? They, they make this exact <laughs> same point. I think it was Marshall and Lily getting together, but something in like their college years, they keep flashing back to it. 
And depending mm-hmm. on who's narrating or talking about it, it's a different vibe. Like when oh, yeah. Marshall tells a story about like being in Lily's dorm room and singing her a song and like serenading <laughs> she her. It's creepy. Well, yeah, you see his perspective <laughs> of it, which is like, I'm doing this thing for this girl I love and we're going to be together forever and I, I'm so happy. Yeah, no, and then funny. you see yeah. like the flip side of what it could be perceived as. I think that's their whole point is like, but if I didn't like you, mm-hmm. if I'm not attracted to you, the other like perspective is like yeah. super creepy dude broke into my dorm room <laughs> waiting for me to come back singing to me like yeah. freak you know like it's it's a very 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 fine line it's all about and perspective i for one it just who especially in this episode it gives me the heebie-jeebies and this takes me back to hh H. holmes once again because he was a relatively handsome guy in his time. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. Getting away with murder. <laughs> Literally. Because you're attractive. Just because you're attractive. Don't trust people just because they're attractive. I mean, this is there are studies done on this in like court cases, how if you're conventionally attractive, you're going to get a lesser sentence than if you're not. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, the bias is really unreal. And yet, what have we all been hearing since the 90s? Don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> Don't get me started on books. Freaking DeSantis. Mm. Books are good. Go read. Go read everything they tell you that you shouldn't read. Right now. Go think for yourself. <laughs> well, not yet. Finish listening to this episode. Not yet. Finish read. our episode. <laughs> They're like, well, if you would finish the episode, maybe I'd finish it. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> and once once uh, the fox throws courage away and he lands on the hand of the fountain mermaid statue. Yes. We hear the sound like a... Cork plugging a bottle. <laughs> yeah. And Courage goes like, oh, 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 Yeah. And then he's sitting on the hand of the statue. Yeah, that's that's rough. I'll let you draw your own conclusions. I was, I didn't like it, mm, to be honest. It was, <laughs> it was a lot. I think it's funny, but oh my God. It was like whatever line the Looney Tunes would go up to, they took it a step further. Then we have William's meat and salami. <laughs> yeah, I wish you guys could see Christian's face. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a feeling they began with William's salami. Mm-hmm. And someone said, No. No, we have to make it a, bu- a butcher shop, not yeah. a William's salami shop. Yeah. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> Courage at one point says, Now keep your dirty hands to yourself, you filthy fox. Mm-hmm. It's just more of this like, you're molesting this granny. Yeah. Like, you're dirty. You're a dirty fox. You're mm-hmm. a fox. You're. Dirty hands. All, I don't know. All, the whole you know. tone. It's really with the point that we're making, listener, is regarding the tone of this villain. Yeah. The sexual tone, if you will. Or if you won't. Or just, he doesn't or just care. Ma- <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> or just the mature tones, because as he's sinking in the, the water, he says, that mm. dog is becoming a real pain in my <laughs> ass. Everybody. Yeah. He wanted to say ass. Ass. And then last, <laughs> my favorite. I'm rolling with granny and flour. Oh. Make me the dish of the hour. Oh. <laughs> uh, wow. I won't even get into the modern slang of rolling somebody in flour. Because that's not what they intended. No. 20 years ago. Mm-mm. It's something that we've touched on a couple times. And it's something that it was one of the motivating factors for us creating this, this show is that we as children recognized it as making us uncomfortable, but we didn't know why. We didn't yet understand why. You're right. I think that discomfort and that like dissonance that we had, mm-hmm. that's the whole, like that's why it's its strange. That's, that's what they were going for. They were going for this strange, unsettled feeling. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways that they achieved that was creating this tone that we didn't get then, but we do get now. You're right. And I don't I don't take this episode as malicious. I don't feel like it was done in any kind of malicious way. Or no, in, I think they were having fun with it. I think it was just fun. Yeah. I don't think that this was done in an attempt to harm children in any way, shape, or form. No. But I do think that there were executives at other studios around this time and in the early 2000s who were incredibly predatory to children. Mm-hmm. But I don't want anyone to make the mistake and think that we're counting this show and this tone oh, no. amongst those predators. Right. It's just, it, it is, it is uncomfortable when you're not familiar. Mm-hmm. And even when you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know we're not, we're not villainizing or saying anything bad about the, the creators. No. I mean, we still like love this show. Yeah, for sure. But that was the point I think was the, 
the discomfort. Right. I think that's a good word. But there's a whole sequence where the fox and Courage and Muriel are on this plane. Yes. Fox strangling Courage. He's a hanging on kind of dog. He's a hanging on kind of dog. This might be a reference to hang dog, Mm -hmm. meaning sad, dejected, depressed. Droopy dog. Yeah, droopy dog. Hang dog. Or like Eeyore. Eeyore. Mm -hmm. Hang donkey. Mm-hmm. Hang hang ass. <laughs> no, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, I don't know. Or it's literally referring to someone who hangs around even though you don't want them there like an ex mm. or something. Just like hang, he's a hang, hang on dog. kind of dog. Yeah. I don't know. Hanging on kind of dog. But of course they, they meant it literally in the episode, but I do agree with you that it seems like they're, they're trying to make a reference. Make a point. Yeah. yeah. Something punny. I also said that it sounded like cats said that line. Yeah. Yeah, you can kind of hear that. That's where I got the crossover. The the plane itself that they're flying in is specifically a biplane, which means it has the two main wings stacked one above the other. Mm -hmm. This is for visual reference for you. He's making uh, motions with his hands to indicate two wings. I'm the plane. And he's the plane, two wings on top of each other. Mm -hmm. I see you. I see it. Thank you for seeing me. You're welcome. Thank you for seeing me. You're welcome. (laughs) Now, there's the whole bit. About how Muriel begins sleepwalking on the wings. Mm -hmm. Synchronized swimming type bit. I feel like I've seen this done in many cartoons. Mm -hmm. This trope of walking slash fighting on airplane wings comes from a specific type of stunt performance from the 20th century known as wing walking. Daredevil stunt performers known as wing walkers would literally climb up onto those wings while the plane was in motion through the air and perform stunts during aerial shows. Yep. It began as a demonstration of the plane's balance, which we see a reference to in this episode. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, this evolved into stunt performances, from pretending to play tennis, to doing handstands, uh, jumping from one plane to another, or hanging onto the plane by one's teeth, Mm -hmm. which Courage also does. He does. In this episode. Mm -hmm. And I found a fun article about the history of wing walking. Wow. So maybe we could do... Like a bonus episode about it or something. Yeah, I mean, terrifying. That I I mean, I wouldn't even go up in a biplane, I don't think, personally. I get way too motion sick. No, it's a little bit too aggressive. Speaking of which, <laughs> may or may not make the episode, but my uh, grandfather, my papa, my dad's dad, mm-hmm. I heard this story throughout my life. They told this story at his funeral. He went up in a biplane, I think with either his brother or his a relative, took him up in a biplane. He unbuckled and stood up in his seat because he needed to throw up huh. and the plane almost crashed because you can't do that when you're like, yeah. it, he wasn't at altitude, I guess, where that was acceptable. I don't know that it is in most biplanes, depending on like the weight distribution and everything. Yeah. But people would tell me like, yeah, you get that, you get that motion sickness from your papa because <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he almost crashed a plane with his. <laughs> Seems like a really good way to get just like sucked out of the plane and just thrown into the air. <laughs> I know. Like, I would rather puke on myself, I think. Yeah, I would just, like... There aren't many situations where I could say that, but, like... Yeah, it's wild. Yikes. Yeah, I I couldn't do it, probably for the motion sickness, but also just, they're dangerous planes. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. That's really all I have for this um, Hmm. this episode. I feel like the sound design is so, so creative for both of these segments of these episodes, Mm -hmm. because it's like a horror film meets a comic book. Almost yeah. coming to yeah. life. That's what these uh, like scores sound like to me. The creativity of the sound design is what stuck with me all of those years. Sound design with everything from the music and the compositions to the mm-hmm. dialogue and the the voice acting. I agree. That's just it. It, it all came back to me based on the sound. Mm-hmm. It's so unique. I think it's why Courage took off, but it's also why it should have endured much longer. Mm-hmm. Should have been a much longer running show. Yeah, if you ask I me. Agree. I loved the music in Cat's Motel. Me too. I thought it was super creepy. Me too. Especially when we'd see the spiders, their theme, mm-hmm. their sound. Yeah, the sound of the spiders. But I will say, I hate Zydeco music. <laughs> I don't. I, hate I don't love Zydeco music myself. Mm. But I do think it was appropriate. But my God, and used appropriately. If I never hear that again, I'll be <laughs> so happy. And also the way that uh, Muriel wakes up at the end and is like immediately just mad at courage. Courage? What am I doing here? I've, I've been trying to save your life yeah. for the past 12 minutes while you've <laughs> been out cold. So that reminds me of maybe something. Maybe don't I can't, wake up mad at me. Yeah, I can't think of. 
I feel like that's a common thing too in this sort of this era of kids entertainment of just like, yes, you're blamed for the thing you were trying to prevent the whole time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It just, I feel like that happened all the time. It did in life. Yeah. And on screen. In life and on screen. For sure. So being our first Courage episode, are we going to do a scareometer for Courage? Oh man, are we? Sure. Why not? I right. Guess we, we did it for Are You Afraid of the Dark? <laughs> yeah. I guess we said we would for our season binges. We don't always do this with like the films and, and everything else that we yeah. cover, but I think it's a fun little segment to add when we're for binging binges, a series. Yeah. Okay. For Cat's Motel, taking into account how scary it is for me as a kid when I was a kid mm-hmm. and how creepy I think a lot of it is mm-hmm. as an adult, the themes and the concept of Cat's Motel is very scary to me. Me too. Everything about it. From the spiders Voyeurism. to the eyes watching me in a room mm-hmm. to being murdered at a place that I'm unfamiliar with. Mm-hmm. I think I got to come out the gate given Cat's Motel like a nine. Wow. Everything about it is just so scary. I was going to say like seven and a half or eight. Yeah. All of the themes in that one are themes that will stick with you. They're themes that are scary regardless of if you're an adult or a child because mm-hmm. it's and and on, honestly, scarier the older that you get and the more that you understand. It's just so realistic. Yeah. These are things that could happen. Yeah. There are a lot of far-fetched scares and spooks in Courage. It's grandiose. As a show. Sure. Um, this is one that's pretty grounded mm. beyond just the, you know, giant spiders. Right. And you got to think of it beyond just those elements. And and the, you know, evil cat. <laughs> mm-hmm. It wouldn't be a cat. It would just be whatever XYZ motel owner that has video of you sleeping 10 years ago that you're unaware of. Oh, God. What about for Cajun Granny Stew? I don't know, like uh, two or three, you know, yeah. <laughs> like super I was going to say three primarily because of yeah. the eyes on that fox. <laughs> <laughs> and and also, birds. I didn't mention this and the birds. The birds. Um, I didn't mention this, but like a lot of like plane crashes, car crashes, like mm-hmm. any type of violent crash like that would have 100% bothered me as a kid. I would have thought about it later. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that with Are You Afraid of the Dark at length, but that was one of my major fears and is one of my major fears. So yeah, yeah, that that gets a couple points Mm -hmm. regardless of the comic nature of the rest of the episode. (laughs) I think my kid logic would have said, well, my mom's not going to be in a plane. So <laughs> no, no, no. So that's why she's safe. <laughs> she's safe because she's not on a plane. Mm-hmm. I don't have OCD. Mm. I don't have to perform the same rituals after lunch every day so that she'll stay alive and be here to pick me up at 3.30. I did it too. I did it too. God damn. That's a lot. I have some final thoughts. Okay. Final thoughts. So the Hitchcock film Psycho was based on the 1959 novel by Robert Block, who lived only 35 miles away from Ed Gein when he was arrested. Whoa. And of course, Ed Gein is famous for making things out of human skin, mm-hmm. like furniture, but also a female bodysuit to wear so that he could pretend to be his dead mother. I can't. Robert Block claims he wrote Psycho before discovering the details of Gein's crimes. Wow. But if that's true, that's one alarming coincidence. One hell of a coincidence, I would say. One hell of a coincidence. Wow. Some people have said that Psycho is based off of Ed Gein's crimes, but the guy himself says, oh, no, no, no. That only happened 35 miles from you. <laughs> At the same time. It has, you know, inspired that, that whole trope. Any kind of like taxidermy, like it's such a staple in horror. And mm-hmm. we probably will see even more references to Psycho in Courage. You think so? Probably. I hope so. I don't know if they'll be intentional, but I just they think it was such, it colored the, the horror genre. Right. So deeply. I just think it was well done. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad we're here talking about it. Me too. Thanks for being here, Christian. Thank you for being here, Kaylin. Thanks for being here, listener. Mm-hmm. We're glad to have you. <laughs> if you guys <laughs> want more content, we have a Patreon. We have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash TPD podcast. We are um, slowly adding content to that now that Christian is no longer working on the movie. Right, right. That he was on. That's all of my to-do list for the next like two or three weeks is just to get bonus content out there and upload it mm-hmm. for your ears for your ears all y'all's listening spooky pleasure but yeah we also have a lot of new faces a lot of new darklings uh listening to oh the show, yeah and we're we've had a so excited massive boom recently yeah thanks tiktok thank you if you came here from tiktok say shout us out say something comment on something let us know that you're here 
it's it's really cool to see our message and like our mission of exploring my cat is yelling he agrees our, our mission of kind of exploring these things that were so formative to us yeah is really resonating with people and i think that's awesome yeah recently we had one person say like you're not alone thanks for reminding me that my childhood was so macabre yeah. <laughs> and i'm like yeah that's it that's what we're doing that's all you guys get it so it's super fun and i'm so glad to be back doing it mm-hmm. i'm ready to keep going and keep putting the stuff out there here here anyway that's all i've got i'm out of words i think i'm out of words too follow our socials follow our socials that's pretty dark email podcast us if you would like to we enjoy hearing from you and talking about your childhood email us say what's up yeah, thanks for being here. And thanks for listening. We're, like a lot of podcasts have like a sign off. We don't really have a sign off, so we yeah, just ended like an out. awkward millennial phone conversation every damn time. Mm-hmm. Well, so enjoy that. We'll let you guys go. <laughs> um, we're gonna we're gonna go eat some dinner. Ooh, you know that's right. But it's not gonna be Cajun granny stew. No, not Cajun granny stew. Thanks for listening to That's Pretty Dark. Written and produced by Christian Baxter Mott and Kaylin Andrews. Our music is composed by Jonathan Simmons, and our art is provided by Paige Garland at Power Girl Illustration. Join the collective nostalgia and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at That's Pretty Dark Podcast. Share your experiences and let us know what shows, films, or villains still haunt you from childhood at That's Pretty Dark Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, you're never really alone. So until next time, sweet dreams, everyone.